Good morning, and welcome to the Competitive Advantage Talks presented by Wasserman. My name is Jill Randolph. I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan, and it is my pleasure to introduce our presentation, No Stone Unturned, Keeping Up with the State of the Art in the Public Domain. Um, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Eric Tulski, Manager of Hockey Analytics at the Carolina Hurricanes. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about uh, how we keep on top of what's going on in the public domain and how we make sure that we're getting as much out of that as we can. Uh, so in-house analysts have certain advantages, right? We have access to understand what the team is trying to do. So there was, in the hockey panel this morning, there was an example of a player doing something that looks suboptimal. And from the outside, you don't know if it's because that's all he's capable of or because that's what he's being asked to do. From the inside, we know what's being done, and we can assess those two things independently. We also know sometimes what limitations they're facing. Maybe it's actually not suboptimal when you consider other things that the team may or may not be capable of doing. And that's both on the ice and off the ice. There are a lot of things that go into decisions that you can't necessarily see from the outside. There's also an advantage internally just in terms of data. So my first time at the Sloan Conference, I was doing a research paper um, that required data that wasn't in the NHL's public data set. And so I basically had to beg my friends to watch games and track stuff by hand for me. Um, whereas, you know, teams can pay money and get rich data sets tracked for them. Um, and so obviously, if you're an analyst, having more and better data is a valuable thing. That being said, there are also advantages that the public domain have. One of the most obvious ones is just pure horsepower, right? Like, a big department in a team might be, you know, maybe three or five or 10 or 15 people, depending what sport we're talking about. You know, maybe some of them have advanced degrees, maybe all of them do. Um, but comparatively, like just NC State, one of our local universities, has a sports analytics club with two professors and 50 students. And so, you know, you think about across all of academia, across all the blogs, across all of Twitter, like there's a lot of horsepower there that we'd like to be able to tap into if we can. There's also a sort of advantage that comes from just the connectivity that's in the public sphere. So I have this image here of what people think of when they imagine inventors. It's you know somebody off in a lab by themselves thinking up crazy ideas. And before I was working for the Hurricanes, I was working for startups in the Silicon Valley. And I'm well aware that that's not what invention looks like these days. Invention comes from people from different backgrounds and different perspectives getting together and talking about their work and having their ideas cross-pollinate and coming up with something better together than they ever would have alone. And that's a lot easier to do on Twitter where you have 100 people having a running conversation than it is in a room by yourself or with a couple people working for a team. There's another advantage that the public has that um, maybe isn't as obvious, um, and it's, I'm calling it objectivity. It's, it's probably not exactly the right word because we all know the bloggers that follow teams are biased also. Um, but their biases aren't the same as the team biases. And so there's an advantage to being able to take advantage of that. And I'll walk through an example here. So some of you will have heard of the term winner's curse. So this is uh, when you have an auction, winning the auction isn't always a good thing. So imagine this player is going to free agency and you need to decide what he's worth. And if we have some omniscient being that knows everything about the player and everything about the league, and you know, that person might say, this player is worth $3 million. Um, the good news for me is, as far as I know, none of the people running any of the teams we're competing against are omniscient beings. And so everybody's going to have their own idea about what the player is worth. And some will think he's worth less, and some will think he's worth more. And so. You ask yourself, who's going to end up signing the player? It's going to be the guy who thinks he's worth $4 million, right? But how's he going to feel about it, right? So he's, what's he going to pay? He's not going to have to pay $4 million, right? He just has to outbid the next highest person. So he's going to get the person at maybe 3.5, 3.6. The other people are saying, you know, no way would I have paid that, right? They think it's a terrible contract. But he thinks it's a bargain by four or $500,000. And so this bias, like, it's not even, before you even get to any of the psychological biases that come from wanting to do well or valuing the things that you have, there's a bias that creeps into the team just from asking the people who made it what they think of it. 
because you're going to tend to end up with the players who you like more than anybody else does. And if you're smarter than everyone else, that's great, but not everybody is smarter than everybody else. And so inherently, every team is going to think more highly of their team than most other people do. Um, and that's not just free agency. The same thing happens in the draft too, right? So every year you will hear the team that picks 17th say, you know, we got the guy who we had 10th and we're really excited about it. And when I was outside, I always thought, you know, that was just the team trying to pump up their player and get their fans excited. But I now have seen enough to know, like, lists really do differ from one team to another. And you often will get your 10th favorite guy with the 17th pick, and you're going to be really excited about your player. And sometimes you're right. Um, but on the whole, across the league, we can't all be right that our teams are better than everyone else thinks. Um, and so you could imagine, let's say hypothetically, um, you might work for a team that's maybe on the playoff bubble um, and is trying to decide what it should do at the trade deadline. Maybe it has a new owner that's trying to get a sense for how good the team is and create a strategy. And so if you try to decide how good you think your team is, you know, if you're the manager of that team, you're going to tend to overrate it, and you're going to be more likely to try to buy than you should. And that's a double whammy, because now not only are you uh, giving away assets when you're not quite there, but that's hurting you. Like, you're probably not there now, and you're putting yourself farther away in the future, too. And so this is a place where turning to the public domain can be advantageous, because you can go look at what people who you know, they may have their biases too, but at least they're not your biases. So their biases are not going to systematically overrate your team the way you will. Um, and fortunately, there are a whole lot of models out there that try to assess uh, what your odds of making the playoffs are. And so consulting that can help ground you in reality and make sure that you are not doing something crazy. Or if you do differ from those by a lot, you need to be able to at least understand why. What is it that you're valuing that nobody else has caught on to and convince yourself that you're right about that? OK, so I told you I'd get back to the horsepower and the connectivity side of it. Um, so as long as we're on the topic of what resources are out there, there are a whole bunch of websites out there that compile various statistics, various views of the game. Um, I've when I say a whole bunch, I mean I couldn't even fit them all on a slide, right? So um, one thing that I want to sort of promote, make sure you guys know about, is a site called Meta Hockey that does a fantastic job of just keeping a list of what's out there. So they log all of these different resources you can find to gather statistics and information and visualizations of data. Um, the other thing they do is every article that's published that they come across, they tag and track in a searchable database. And it's just a really powerful resource for keeping on top of what's going on out there. Um, so I, I highly recommend that you use it if you aren't already. In those articles, there's a lot of useful information. Um, and one of the things that I think is most beneficial from just having this huge volume of people out there doing work um, is that it's a source of ideas. Like I told you, it's really hard to sit off on your own and come up with something that's better than anything anyone else has. And so just thinking of this wealth of information as a place you can go mine for new ideas and new ways of thinking of things is really useful, I think. And so I've picked an example here. Micah McCurdy did some work where before then, almost everything that was done with goalies was just about did they stop the puck or not. And so sometimes it factored in where the shot came from or other information like that. There was a little bit of work on rebound control. But he was the first one that I know of to really try to build a model around everything a goalie does, from freezing the puck to putting the rebound into a place where nobody's going to get it, and take a sort of Markov chain modeling to going through the different situations you might be in as a result of the goalie's action. And so that, you know, coming, being exposed to that kind of idea might send you down a whole avenue that you wouldn't have thought to go down if you weren't. And, just sort of trolling what's out there to see how people are thinking about things will give you some of these ideas that will open new avenues that you can go down. Um, another example that really, I think, highlights the connectivity, um, a lot of you will, know, will have heard of Corsi, which is basically just counting how many shots each team takes. And there's real value in that. And everybody who hears about it, their first thought is, OK, but you know, how dangerous were the shots, right? And you want to start adjusting for which shots came from dangerous locations of the ice. 
and trying to sort of turn it into an expected goals metric that values getting a whole bunch of dangerous shots. And you know, over the course of probably a decade, there were maybe a dozen different people who tried to do this. And every time you can come up with an expected goals model and when you use it to try to predict the future, it never did better than just basic shot attempts. And that's kind of a weird thing. And it, you know, it seemed like that can't be right. And so there was just this long running back and forth of people trying to come up with new ways of identifying things that might help you tell that a shot is gonna be dangerous. So factoring in, hey, what if it's a rebound? Or what if we can tell that it came off of the rush or stuff like that? And as we identified more and more of those details that might tell you something about how dangerous a shot was, eventually we got to where some work by uh, two researchers working for hockey graphs um, came up with something that did prove to be more predictive than just basic shot attempts did. Um, there also are sort of avenues that people aren't necessarily exploring on their own. Um, so one of those, I think we do a lot with evaluating players um, and strategy to some degree, but very rarely getting directly into what the coach is doing and why. Um, and there are just starting to be a few metrics that really separate what are we doing from why are we doing it. And uh, so I've highlighted one here by Tyler Dello, just looking at how often a coach during the game decides to juggle his lines. And does he do it more often when he's trailing? And does he do it more often than most coaches do? And you know, you could imagine trying to identify a whole bunch of things like that that a coach might decide to do during a game that you can separate completely from what the players are doing and how good they are and really try to get at um, what decisions coaches can make throughout a game. So everything I've shown you so far has been about, um, about has, been, has come from blogs and uh, sort of the, uh, the part of the world where it's really easy to publish. And I think that's a great source of ideas because people are putting things out there constantly and this running conversation of hundreds of people on Twitter is a fertile ground for ideas. Um, it's not always where you get the most advanced, most rigorous methods, right? And so that's a place where I turn to academic journals to find um, new techniques that I might use to attack the ideas that I'm coming up with. So I've highlighted one here by Lopez and Shuckers looking at shootouts, um, where instead of just looking at what a guy's shootouts results were, they did a more complicated thing with resampling and hierarchical modeling to try to assess how good they expect him to be going forwards, and also how many wins they would expect that to add to a team. Um, and so that sort of more uh, technically rigorous um, development is something that is more prominent in academic journals. Um, and so it's, that's, a, I think, a good use of that space, is to find ways of approaching problems that you might not find in a blog. And then, you know, I think, a question people are always going to wonder, like there's a lot out there and it takes a lot of time to mine it. And so you're always going to wonder, like, is it really going to get you ahead, right? That's, you have a limited amount of time to put into this and is it going to give you an advantage? Um, so many of you were, I'm sure, here last year when the Florida Panthers stood up here and talked about what they do in the draft. Um, and it was a really interesting talk about how they use data and um, try to get an edge in the draft. And if you were here for that, uh, what you might not have known is that everything that they were talking about grew out of stuff that they had published a few years earlier. So if you've been reading the blogs and keeping on top of it, you, know, you could have been doing it already before they ever came here talking about it. Um, so for sure it is advantageous to, not, to make sure that you're on top of what's going on out there. Um, everything so far has been about sort of passive engagement with the public sphere, right? Like just being aware of what's going on, not necessarily directly interacting with it. Um, active engagement is important too, right? So I am not on Twitter talking to people in public about how I would do things, but I have some confidants who I will talk to in private and have ideas kicking around with. Um, and we are working to increase our engagement with the public domain, getting people to help us with problems that we have. So, I mentioned the NC State Sports Analytics Club. We announced a couple weeks ago we're going to be partnering with them and getting them to help us with some of our problems. Um, we have an increased outreach that's in the works. There are a couple of posts on the Sloan uh, job board. Um, 
And so if you are interested in working with us, please send me an email at analytics at carolinahurricanes.com. I hope to hear from you, and thanks for your time, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. So I'm going to try and figure a question that's not going to make you tap into any of your magic secrets, at least publicly. I'll wait for later for that. Um, but one of the things I'm curious about is you, you can maintain active en engagement, especially with a, like a big group like the, the NC State gang. Mm -hmm. um, how, can you, how do you feel like you can encourage them to put themselves out there where you're not exposing too much of your own you know, liability towards what you guys are already thinking inside? Yep. So there are a couple different answers to that. One is um, it's easy to give them open-ended questions. Give them a pile of data and see what they come up with, right? And then as long as I can be sure that they're not giving the data away and you can do that, um, then there's nothing else that they have that they could share. Um, if there are more specific things that I want answered, um, some of it can be things that um, that I don't think would necessarily be useful in other people's hands, either because it's a problem that's specific to us or because there are other things that I think you need to know to make use of that. Um, and so part of the energy that's gone into making sure this collaboration is gonna work is coming up with ideas like that, where I can give someone a directed problem that will help us with a problem we have, but not, I mean, you're right, like these are, it's not an employment agreement they're going to go somewhere else in six months, and I don't want them taking our state secrets with them. So um, there are ways of managing that and making sure that they have interesting problems to work on, but nothing that I'm afraid of getting out. Yeah. Thank you. Are you familiar with any organizations, researchers, who are doing more research on the mindset, on the emotional uh, let's say, skills of athletes, not just the physical skills, but the emotional skills that drive performance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a lot of work done on that. Um, it tends not to be prominent in the hockey analytics circle of Twitter, um, but there are for sure consultants and academic researchers who are working on that. Um, ultimately, the, the set of things that... Um, what I would call hockey analytics Twitter tends to look at is the outcome of the combination of their mental state and their physical state. And you know, a blogger can tell that this guy does this thing well without knowing whether it's because he's confident enough to do it or because he's skilled enough to do it. Right. Hey, Eric. Um, how do you handle some of the sample sizes that these data sets have? Sometimes they have individuals tracking games and they're not, tr they're not all tracked, not all players are tracked. How do you... How do you manage that? Yeah, so more data is always better. And having you know, three games is better than zero, and having 12 is better than three, and having 1,271 is a lot better than 12. Um, so ultimately, there, you know, there are statistical ways of assessing the reliability of a sample size, right? And um, you should be able, for any piece of data that you're given, you should be able to answer how certain am I that this is actually going to hold up if I have a future data set that's much larger? Um, and so the way I interpret it, you know, if I have three games of data that points in a direction, it, is, it might be weak evidence that this thing is true. And you might need more data to convince yourself that it's actually true, but this is some weak evidence pointing in that direction. And so you never want to just dismiss something because it's not a large sample size. You just need to remember in your head that you can't fully believe it yet either. And I think um, a big part of an analyst's job is keeping track of how certain they can be about anything and what it would take to convince them that they were wrong about it. Yeah. Um, so there's gonna be sort of player tracking data uh, coming to the NHL soon. And uh, sort of in hockey, we're maybe a little behind the curve on that type of data and doing analysis with it. So, you know, looking outside of hockey, looking at sports like basketball or soccer where this is um, more prevalent, what sort, of, uh, what sort of techniques or what sort of um, 
areas of sort of research are you most interested in um, once we have this data uh, for hockey? Yeah, so a big part of the value for me in both reading blogs in the public domain and coming to conferences like this is it's a way for me to get exposed to what other sports are doing. Um, and so partly you can learn what kind of challenges we're going to have, both just data management and extracting information from the data. Um, and partly you can learn what kinds of hires have worked out best for that and think about, you know, what your hiring plan might look like to position you well to be able to take advantage of that data when it comes along. Um, and so that's really the stage we're in right now is um, anticipating that the data is coming, trying to lay the groundwork to make sure that we're ready to get the most out of it that we can when we have it. Okay. Um, I think that's all the time we have, so thank you for your time. <laughs>